Okay, my friends, now I want to address something, and I don't even know if you're going to understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm going to address idol worship because I think in our lifetime we thought that this didn't apply to us. It so much does. And, uh, you know, we think about a, an idol being that little, you know, a little golden calf or something that you go in and you go, why would anybody do that? That doesn't even make sense to me. But an idol is anything that we worship, anything that we value so much that we would put it above God, that it's more important to us than God is. And so um, in January of 2009, the Lord began to talk to me. And the very first word that he gave me, this he gave me four words that very first night that he started speaking. And the very first thing that he said was found in uh, Ezekiel 14, but it says, my people, actually said my priest, but he told me it's my people. My people have set up idols in their heart and they have set before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Will I allow these people to inquire me of, of me anything? And he said, I will not. He said, repent. Because if you come to me with idols still in your heart, I'm going to cut you off from among my people and I'm going to make you a sign in a proverb. Guys, God is not playing. There, are, This idolatry is very real. It's very... Um, hmm, Okay, and it could be anything. It could be your cell phone. That's my idol. I worship. I worship the pictures I take of myself. I worship whatever skill. Um, the first time I ever went to an A&M football game, and we sat up in the nosebleed sections, and we had two sons who were going to A&M at the time, and and uh, anyway, I looked around there. We were way up at the top. I could see all around the stadium. And I looked there and I heard them and it's oh, the roar and all around and surround. And I thought, oh my goodness, these people are worshiping. They are worshiping. And it occurred to me that, um, that sports is an idol. Um, there's, there's a lot of idols, but I'm going to deal with one because it keeps coming up over and over again. I'll try to find several places of it, um, where I can give you references. Um, but I want to, want to tell you this. Okay. The Lord showed me about three or four years ago, I wish I had written down the date, but I didn't have it. Um, my pastor thinks it's right at the beginning of the last election, which would have been 2016. Um, cause he said something did change in the spirit realm, but, um, the Lord showed me the 70 years of peace is over that for 70 years, he did not fight the spirits. He let it play out. You know, we could do whatever we wanted to do and God didn't fight us. I found it in Zechariah. I'll probably try to, I'll share that message sometime. I don't know. But anyway, um, then I started paying attention to what happens after the 70 years because there's a 70 year period. Um, then in Jeremiah, this is what it says. Everybody's going to go into captivity in Babylon and Babylon's a spirit. I am and there is none other. It's all about me. And Jeremiah says, everybody has to. If you don't go into captivity, then you're going to die by the sword or famine or disease or something. Anyway, um, so we all have been in exile or captivity to Babylon, a very selfishness for 70 years. This has been my whole entire lifetime. And so we did, and we worked hard, and we did whatever we wanted to do and everything, and we made decisions and choices and, and generation after generation, and you can kind of see it playing out, okay? But in, in Jeremiah, uh, it talks about what happens at the end of this 70 years. And this is what happens is that um, God's going to take the cup of his wrath filled with his fury. And he's going to make every one of the nations drink from it. Okay. And so that's what happened about three or four years ago. The spirits, psh, 
there now God's coming to fight for his people. So, you know, all this started happening. <laughs> At the same time, this 70 year period, Jeremiah 29 says, after the 70 years are over, I'm going to come back for you, my people, and I'm going to bring you into your own land. I know the plans I have you, plans to prosper, not to harm, plans to give you hope in a future. And you're going to seek, you're going to find me if you seek me with your whole heart. So that's Jeremiah 29 and 25. It says, it says this, it says, oh, it's crazy. This is the reason why the wrath of God is being poured out on the whole world the whole earth, the whole world. It says, again and again, the Lord has sent you his servants, the prophets, but you have not listened or even paid attention. And each time the message was this, turn from the evil road you have been traveling and from the evil things you're doing. Only then will I let you live in this land that the Lord gave you to, and your ancestors forever. Do not provoke my ang anger by worshiping the idols you made with your own hands, then I will not harm you. Sweet Jesus, we've worked hard. We have, and we've accomplished things. God's given us talents and abilities and and you can see it. The, the, here's the results and we go, oh, look at me. Look at what I did. Sweet Jesus, we don't even know. We have no clue. And we think, oh, well, that's not all that bad. I worked hard. You don't even know. I did it. I did good. And the Lord said, I've told you again and again, stop worshiping idols. Sweet Lord Jesus. We didn't know. Lord, forgive us for worshiping the idols that our hands have made. Forgive us for worshiping all of the gifts that you've given to us, all the talents, all the abilities. Forgive us, Lord, because we're guilty. And God, you're going to have to tear down the idols you are. I don't know that we can do it. Okay, so then the Lord was showing me Abraham. And you know what? Um, Abraham, um, God promised him a son. He would be the father of many nations. And so when he had Isaac, when he was 100 years old, this was the child of promise. This was every promise that God had ever given him was wrapped up in this little boy. And that boy became an idol he was on the throne of, of Abraham's heart. And God said, put Isaac on the altar. And I want you to kill him. Don't you know that that was a very real physical thing that God was asking him to do? Put his idol, his son, his only son on the altar. And I want you to kill him. And do you know that when Abraham raised his arms to sacrifice his son, his son was ripped off the throne of his heart and God was placed there in its rightful place. His son was no longer his idol. So I don't know what it is that um, is sitting on the throne of your heart. Um, but the only one that can sit there is God himself. That is a throne meant for the creator of the universe and him alone. Nobody else. He alone will be worshiped. And so we have to come before him. Mm. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to pray over you because any of the Ezekiel 36 or 37, somewhere in there. This is what it says. I'm going to let you inquire of me to do this for them. So I'm going to pray to God for him to do this for you, okay? I am asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would take out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. 
I am asking right now that you would sprinkle clean water on whoever is listening to this right now, that they will be clean. I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would tear down every idol and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God that's sitting in this heart, that you would completely knock it down in Jesus' name and that you would pour in its place the spirit of the living God. Pour out your spirit into this life and this heart. God, make him a well-watered garden and a fortified city for your glory. I'm just asking that in the mighty name of Jesus. God, you're going to have to do this for your name's sake, for your holy name's sake, because I don't know that we can do it by ourselves. So I'm asking that in Jesus' name. Amen.